Hello everyone, this is Margarita from DrRegisterNurse.com. Today we're going to talk about the pathophysiology of beta blockers. You do not want to miss it. Beta blockers are called adrenergic antagonists. So if you saw the alpha and beta receptor video in this channel, Dr. Registered Nurse, you will know that the word antagonist means that it's something that's going to go against a normal response. For example, if somebody's heart rate is supposed to be elevated, a medication that's considered an antagonist, such as a beta blocker, is going to lower that heart rate. So it's going to give the opposite effect of what the normal response is. So, what do beta blockers do? Beta blockers block beta receptors from receiving the sympathetic nervous system response. This response is what's responsible for the fight or flight sensation that you get whenever you are walking, running, or under stressful situations because it's driven by the hormone adrenaline. So when adrenaline is secreted in your body, it's going to result in an increased heart rate, the bronchioles are going to dilate in order for you to have all those open airways to receive the extra blood flow that occurs due to vasodilation of those arteries in the skeletal muscles. In addition, you're going to have an increase in the strength of contraction of the heart and you're going to have an elevated blood sugar or hypoglycemia. So those are all the things that are going to help you deal with stressful situations or in instances where you just need a little bit more energy or a little bit more excited or just happy because it does happen when you are happy. Selective and non-selective are two different types of beta blockers. The non-selective can have an effect on any of the receptor sites as opposed to the selective that is selective to a particular receptor site. So just to review, make sure that you understand what the word antagonist means because it's going to go against a normal response. Make sure you understand what the normal response of the stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, which is to increase the heart rate, bronchodilate in order for you to have more open airways and take a deep breath like this. And also increase the strength of the heart's contraction as well as increase the blood glucose and vasodilate those arteries of the skeletal muscle so that it can have more room for that extra blood flow that is coming through due to the stimulation of these receptor sites. So now we're going to talk about the different types of beta receptors and I love discussing these. So you have the beta 1, the beta 2, and the beta 3 receptor sites. The beta 1 receptor sites again one for one heart are located in the cardiac node cells of your heart as well as in the juxtalar glomerular cells of your kidneys. Now remember that the cardiac nodes are responsible for the conduction, the energy conduction that produces a forceful contraction of the heart in order for all that oxygenated blood to be released to the rest of your body. So if I'm going to give an antagonizing medication like a specific or a selective beta blocker, for example, metoprolol, it's going to have the opposite effect. So if the heart rate is high and I give a specific or selective beta blocker that's going to act on the beta-1 receptor site, the heart rate is going to drop. Now the just glomerular cells of your kidneys are responsible for the release of renin. And renin is a hormone that starts the process of angiotensin 1 that converts to angiotensin 2 and angiotensin 2 is a major vasoconstrictor. So the ultimate goal of the release of renin is to increase the blood pressure. So if I were to give a cardiac selective beta blocker which will act on the beta 1 receptors of your heart as well as in the juxtaglomerular cells of your kidneys, what do you think is going to happen? it's going to have the opposite effect. So the peripheral vascular resistance is going to decrease due to vasodilation and the blood pressure drops. Now we're gonna to go to the beta-2 receptor sites. The beta-2 receptor sites are the lungs, two for two lungs, and also the arteries of the skeletal muscles. So the primary role of the beta-2 receptor sites in the bronchioles is to keep those airways open in order for you to take a deep breath. So if I were to give a beta blocker that is a non-specific beta blocker, which are the ones that act on either beta-1, 
beta 2 or even beta 3 receptor sites, it's going to do the antagonist effect of actually decreasing those airways. So the bronchioles are not going to stay open. They're not going to be dilated. They're actually going to be constricted. So now the patient that maybe has asthma or some pulmonary disease is going to have a hard time breathing. So you have to be careful. So you should not administer a non-selective beta blocker that can have an effect on any of these receptor sites to someone that has pulmonary issues because instead of keeping those airways open they're going to constrict and it's not going to allow them to take a deep breath or even a good breath so they're going to express symptoms of shortness of breath and if i were to give a non-selective beta blocker that again acts on the beta 2 beta 1 or beta 3 receptor sites instead of having these arteries dilate in the skeletal muscle so that that extra rich blood flow can flow through your body when you have a sympathetic nervous system response, that fight or flight, it's going to constrict so your muscles are not going to get enough oxygenation that they need in order to deal with whatever that stressful situation is, that's happening that has released adrenaline. Did you know that there are other beta-2 receptor sites? Your eyes have ciliary muscles. These muscles control eye accommodation as well as regulate the flow of aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is the liquid substance that is found in your eye. Can you think of a patient that may have excessive amounts of this? Patients that have glaucoma have an excessive amount of fluid in their eye. And the stimulation of these beta-2 receptors is just like in any beta-2 receptor site. It's going to cause vasodilation. And this vasodilation is going to cause an increase in the aqueous humor fluid in your eye, making the pressure go up. Hence why patients are diagnosed with glaucoma. And glaucoma is a condition of increased pressure within the eyeball that causes gradual loss of your sight because it starts damaging the optic nerve. So when non-selective or non-specific beta blockers are given to patients that have increased eye pressure, it will cause vasoconstriction, which will then decrease the formation of aqueous humor and decrease the pressure of the eye. A common medication that is given as an eye drop to patients that suffer from increased ocular pressure is called Timolol which is a non-selective or non-specific beta blocker. Now we have the beta-3 receptor sites. The beta-3 receptor sites are located not only in your adipose tissue, which is your fat, but they're also located in your urinary bladder. So when it's in your adipose tissue, what it does is that when they are stimulated, it breaks down fat. Beta-3 receptor sites are also located in your bladder. This way, your bladder is relaxed and it prevents urination. Another place that you'll find beta-2 receptors is in the GI tract as well as the liver. In the GI tract, when the beta-2 receptors are stimulated, it's going to decrease motility. So if I give a patient a non-selective beta blocker, it's going to increase the motility because remember, it's going to antagonize the normal response. This is why patients that are on non-selective beta blockers sometimes complain of GI problems. You can also find beta-2 receptor sites in the liver. When they are stimulated, it will increase glucose metabolism and lipolysis. And glucose metabolism is basically the breakdown of glucose. So the patient can become hypoglycemic, which means that their blood sugar will drop. So you have to make sure that you're monitoring your patient's blood sugar regularly and closely because it can cause a hypoglycemic event. Lipolysis means that it can break down fat cells. So now let's go over an easy way to remember what are those things that beta blockers do. We're going to use the mnemonic beta made. But first, I want to show you something. Look at this pill bottle right here. I have some names in here. And what do you see that's the same for all of them? The ending. So O-L-O-L. -O -L. All beta blockers end in O-L-O-L. -L. As you see, metoprolol, O-L-O-L. -L. Atenolol, nevitolol. Bisoprolol. These are all considered selective beta blockers. So these medications act on what receptor site? 
the beta-1 receptor site because they are selective, they're cardiac selective. Now we have propanolol and anetolol. Those are considered non-selective beta blockers. So those can work where? In the beta-1 receptor sites, beta-2, and beta-3. So they do not discriminate amongst any of the sites. So remember that. These are selective beta blockers, cardiac selective, and these are non-selective. And they all end in O-L-O-L. -L. Now why is a patient prescribed a beta blocker? If they have an irregular heart rhythm, like an arrhythmia, that they need a medication that's going to slow down the conduction so that that heart rate can slow down and you know the contraction is not going to be as forceful. If they've had heart failure, and also if they've had a heart attack caused by systolic dysfunction. But let me just get something clear. Sometimes when a patient is on a beta blocker because of the action that it does, because it slows everything down and you might have some pooling of blood in the ventricles in your heart, it's not moving as fast as normal without the medication, you can have some early signs and symptoms of heart failure. For example, you might have shortness of breath and you can have lower extremity edema. Your peripherals may get a little cold as well. So know those are things that are considered adverse effects of beta blockers, but know that they are given to patients that have had heart failure in the past because it does allow the heart to work better. I have it here. It helps the heart beat more slowly with less force, which in turn decreases the blood pressure and decreases the cardiac output. So all those things are very helpful when someone has had heart failure or has had a heart attack. Now, remember, it blocks the effect of stress hormones, adrenaline. So instead of having that rapid heart rate, the vasodilation from those skeletal muscle cells, the bronchial dilation is going to have the antagonist effect, the opposite of that. So now let's get to the mnemonic beta made. And I have it all laid out right here. So we have B E T A. M-A-D-E. So the first one is B for bronchospasms. Remember when we talked about non-selectives and patients that have pulmonary problems? So beta-2 receptor sites, where the bronchioles are, those are responsible for maintaining those airways open. So if I were to give a patient a non-selective beta blocker, which means that it's going to antagonize the effect of the beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3 receptor sites, do you think that those bronchioles are going to stay open? They're not. They are going to constrict. And what's going to happen is that they're going to go into bronchospasms because they're going to try to keep opening and opening, but they can't because they were given a non-selective beta blocker. So patients that have any type of pulmonary problems or bronchoconstrictive disease should not get non-selective beta blockers. If they do get a beta blocker, it should be a cardiac selective, for example, metoprolol. Now we have E. E is for elicits a decrease in the conduction, and we talked about the nodes, as well as a decrease in the contraction, which is going to result in a decrease in the heart rate. And I put in like a little addition formula here. So you have decreased conduction plus a decrease in contraction is going to give you a result of decreased heart rate. And if you were to have a phone that the battery is low, is it going to work the same as if the battery is fully charged? It's not. So if I'm going to give a patient a beta blocker, it's going to have an effect on the conduction pathway because that is where the receptor sites are in the cardiac node cells as well as in the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys. But that will go with the next one in T. So if I'm going to give someone a beta blocker, it's going to have an effect on the conduction pathway. And if you don't have enough energy the heart is not going to contract as forcefully and then the heart rate is not going to be as high. So when you give a patient a beta blocker, the conduction decreases and because it doesn't have enough energy to give a full contraction, the contraction decreases and because the contraction is less, which means that the cardiac output is going to be less, you're going to have a decreased heart rate. That is why when you give a patient a beta blocker, one of the parameters that you need to assess as the nurse is that heart rate. Because if the heart rate is less than 60, which is abnormal, 
because it is low, they should not get a beta blocker because it's going to lower the heart rate even lower. Now we go to T for treat hypertension. This is why beta blockers are given to treat hypertension. And as you know, the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys release renin, which is a powerful hormone that's going to eventually result in that stimulation of the angiotensin II, which is a big vasoconstrictor. The beta blocker is going to antagonize that effect. So instead of having an increase in the blood pressure, now the patient's peripheral vascular resistance has decreased because there's vasodilation and the blood pressure drops. Then we have A for arrhythmias. So just like I said before, beta blockers are given for arrhythmias because it decreases the conduction. Remember that the conduction is the energy. So if the conduction is decreased, the heart is going to work less forcefully. So the heart rate is going to drop. So if you have someone that has sinus tachycardia or some type of arrhythmia and they're given a beta blocker, that's going to reduce that heart rate to a more normal rhythm. Then we have M, masks hypoglycemia symptoms. Now, let's talk about what are those symptoms that you feel when you are hungry. You feel tired, your heart rate goes up, you may get a headache, you have hunger pains. Well, remember, because a beta blocker decreases the conduction, which decreases the contraction and decreases the heart rate, if you have a patient that is a diabetic, do you think that they're going to be able to get that tachycardia that you would feel when you are hungry or when your sugar is low? They're not because the beta blocker is antagonizing that symptom. So it is very important that you let your diabetics know to check their sugars regularly because if they're on a beta blocker, they're not going to be able to tell if their blood sugar is low or is it the beta blocker that they took because the beta blocker is going to decrease the symptom of tachycardia or increased heart rate that you would feel when you're below when you have a low blood Let's sugar. Go to A for AV blocks. If somebody has an AV block, which means that there is a conduction problem already, and you were to give them a beta blocker, you can put them into a further block. Make sure you watch the video on AV blocks in this channel, Dr. Register Nurse, and that's going to give you a baseline as to the different types of treatments that exist for a first degree block as compared to a second degree and a third degree. Because as the degrees increase, the treatment progresses to the point of needing a pacemaker. So if I were to have a first degree AB block, I'm being monitored. I'm not on medications. I, I don't need a pacemaker. But if I were to take a beta blocker having some type of block, especially if I have a second degree heart block, which will lead to the ultimate third degree, I can go into the next level or even worse. So I might have to move from being just monitored to taking medications and the probability of getting a pacemaker or actually needing a pacemaker. So you have to be careful when patients are given a beta blocker if they already have AV blocks because it can make them worse. Now let's go to D. Don't abruptly stop. This medication should not be abruptly stopped because remember, it has an effect on your heart rate because of the conduction. It has an effect on your blood pressure. So if you abruptly stop the medication instead of tapering it down according to the prescription that you get from your healthcare provider, you will have a rebound effect. So instead of having a decreased heart rate and a decreased blood pressure, you're gonna have rebound tachycardia, which is an increased heart rate, as well as rebound high blood pressure. So never abruptly stop a beta blocker. You need to taper it down. Okay. Now we have E for erectile dysfunction. And this is due to the decreased blood flow that occurs when somebody takes a beta blocker. So now let's do some XX questions. Make sure that you go back into this channel's playlist, Dr. Registered Nurse, and look at the part one and part two of test taking strategies and use them when looking at these questions. Remember to cover the answers. So go over one, two, and three, and in the next slide, we will review the answers. So the first question is, a patient is admitted with asthma and has a history of high blood pressure. They are due to get the following medications. Which one would you question?
So this relates to asthma, so I have my answers covered as per part one of the test taking strategies video. So with asthma and a history of high blood pressure, I'm going to see, okay, so they're asking me about medications. So what can affect the patient that has asthma? So I know that there are some medications like nebulizer treatments that will help, that they're actually an agonist medication, so it will help keep airways open, but there are others that are antagonists that can have a problem. For example, a nonspecific beta blocker. If I were to give a nonspecific beta blocker to a patient that has active asthma, I'm going to cause a constriction of those airways. So I'm going to look at my choices and I'm going to see, well, a multivitamin does not give me any concern for a negative patient outcome. Propanolol, 50 milligrams PO, Yes. Metoprolol? No, because metoprolol is a cardiac selective medication. So it will only work in the beta-1 receptor sites of the heart and the juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys. Heparin, 5,000 units of Q, does not affect my asthmatic patient. And B and C, which is the E choice, is not because that includes propanolol, which is a non-selective or non-specific beta blocker. And as we talked about in this lesson, those should not give, be given to patients that have respiratory issues. So now that you know all of the things that beta blockers do, according to the mnemonic that's right here, you can kind of tell what are those things that you as a nurse, a nursing student, should be assessing on your patient as well as looking for and use this information for patient teaching. But let's go through what are those adverse effects that you should keep in mind when giving a patient a beta blocker. One, we talked about the early heart failure symptoms that they can feel due to the decreased cardiac output. So they may feel shortness of breath, they can have lower extremity edema, as well as some coughing. They can also feel tired because remember the conduction, the energy current is slowed down, so the heart rate is slowed, their blood pressure drops. So one of the adverse effects that can occur due to a decreased heart rate, your cardiac output is decreased, you feel, you're going to feel tired because the heart rate drops, your blood pressure drops, so they might not have as much energy, which is why it's considered an adverse effect of medications, but it doesn't affect every patient, but a lot of patients have complaints of having this symptom. Also, because their blood pressure drops, they may feel dizzy. So make sure you keep that into account when you're taking care of these patients. Put those fall precautions on, for example, the bed all the way down, put that call bell within reach, the bedside table close to the patient, and inform the patient that they need to sit down for a couple of minutes prior to getting up, not to get up too quickly because they can get dizzy and fall. We have to make sure that we take those proper precautions in order to prevent a negative patient outcome. And also we talked about erectile dysfunction, but it can also happen in women where they can have a decreased libido due to the effects of beta blockers because of the decreased blood flow to those regions. So make sure you let your patients know men and women. In men, it can cause the erectile dysfunction and in men and women, their libido may drop. Their hands and feet can feel cold and they may get a little bit of GI upset. They may have um, some stomach aches. They may, they, some patients have complained of having a little bit of nausea, vomiting, and even diarrhea symptoms. So now we're gonna talk about those things that you as a nursing student or nurse have to assess prior to administrating a beta blocker after the administration. And what are you gonna teach your patient regarding this medication? So here you have some more questions. Remember, practice your test taking strategies and refer back to part one and part two of test taking strategies that is located in this YouTube channel's playlist, Dr. Registered Nurse. So now let's answer a couple of more questions. The first, what adverse effects can occur with beta adrenergic receptor blockers? This is a select all that apply. A, bradycardia, B, bronchospasm, C, masking of hypoglycemia, D, impotence, or E, sedation. So which ones would you pick? Beta blockers, as you know, decrease the heart rate because of the conduction delay. 
it is going to decrease the conduction pathway, which leads to a decrease in contraction, which in turn decreases the heart rate. So A is part of the answer. Bronchospasms. Is this correct for beta adrenergic receptor blockers? Yes. If you give a patient a non-selective beta blocker, it's going to work in the receptor sites of beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. So if a patient has asthma and you give them a non-selective beta blocker, it's going to, instead of keeping the bronchioles open in order for you to be able to breathe, is going to constrict them. And the patient is going to go into bronchospasms because the bronchioles are going to try to open because they are unable to get proper oxygenation. Masking of hypoglycemia symptoms. Hypoglycemia is low blood sugar. Remember that one of the signs uh, of low blood sugar is tachycardia. If a patient is taking a beta blocker that, it, that is also a diabetic, they are not going to be able to have that symptom because beta blockers decrease the heart rate due to causing the conduction delay. So the symptom of tachycardia that you would feel when you are hungry or when your sugar is low is going to be masked. So that is also part of the correct answer. Impotence. We talked about how the low blood flow to certain regions of the body can cause a decreased libido in men and women. And in men, it can also cause erectile dysfunction. So that is also part of the answer. Now sedation. Is sedation considered an adverse effect of the beta blockers? Yes, sedation is one of those adverse effects that can occur with beta blockers. Remember that beta blockers decrease the heart rate and blood pressure. So when a patient exhibits symptomatic bradycardia, low heart rate, and hypotension, low blood pressure, they may feel like they are sedated. They are feeling very tired. Some treatments that can be given to the patient that has developed symptomatic bradycardia and hypotension from beta blocker use is glucagon. As glucagon increases the heart rate as well as the myocardial contractility and will improve the AV conduction. Therefore, increasing the heart rate, giving the patient more energy and feeling less sedated. Let's move on to the second question. A nurse is monitoring a patient that takes carvitolol or Coreg. Which of the following assessment findings made by the nurse would warrant a possible complication with the use of this medication? One of the test taking strategies that I teach my students is that when you're looking at answer choices, you want to see what can produce a negative patient outcome. So when you're looking at each choice, look at it as, is this going to cause an effect on my patient that is going to be negative when it asks you about a complication? So let's look at these choices. A, baseline blood pressure of 160 over 100 millimeters of mercury, followed by a blood pressure of 120 over 70 after three doses. B, baseline heart rate of 97 beats per minute, followed by a heart rate of 62 beats per minute after three doses. C, complaints of nightmares and insomnia. D, complaints of dyspnea. So looking at the test taking strategies from part one and part two in this channel, we can see which ones we can eliminate. Now, a, that is a normal response of beta blockers. It is going to decrease the blood pressure and the blood pressure of 120 over 70 is considered normal. So I'm going to eliminate that choice. B, baseline heart rate of 97 beats per minute followed by a heart rate of 62 beats per minute after three doses is also considered a normal response. So I'm going to eliminate answer choice B. C, complaints of nightmares and insomnia and D, complaints of dyspnea. So I have narrowed it down to C and D. Now looking at that strategy that I told you in the beginning, which of the two can cause a possible complication that can develop a negative patient outcome? If you chose D, you are correct because this can cause other issues in the patient. When someone is unable to take good breaths or has difficulty breathing, it can cause other complications. Nightmares and insomnia can be a concern because the patient needs to sleep but it's not something that's going to cause a complication like respiratory distress. So now let's talk about those things that you should do prior to giving a patient a beta blocker. Now with any medication that you're going to give a patient, make sure that you're always checking for allergies. Sometimes they might not remember at the time of admission 
or their caregiver might have not been in the room with them. So ask them that question and if they do say that they're allergic to something, make sure that they have an allergy bracelet on, which is usually red. Now, if they are allergic to beta blocker, they should not get the medication and you need to alert the healthcare provider. Next, let's assess those lung sounds and pulse ox. Remember that we talked about those early signs and symptoms of heart failure that can occur with a beta blocker. Also, the patient's gonna feel tired. They may feel shortness of breath due to the decreasing conduction that occurs when you give a patient a cardiac selective or even a non-selective beta blocker. So we wanna make sure that they're able to take a good deep breath and that they don't have any abnormal lung sounds prior to administering the medication so that we can get a good baseline. We're also gonna check a blood pressure and heart rate. Make sure you get a current blood pressure and heart rate before administering a medication because although sometimes you may get a blood pressure and heart rate from earlier in the morning, things with patients can change very quickly. So it's always good to get a new set of vital signs. That way you can have a baseline assessment as to where your patient started and making sure that you're not administering the medication. If the blood pressure and heart rate do not fall within the correct parameters. So if their blood pressure is very low or their heart rate is under 60, they should not be getting the beta blocker. We also want to check a blood sugar on a diabetic patients because beta blockers mask hypoglycemia symptoms. One other thing that beta blockers do is called glycogenolysis, which means that glucose starts breaking down and feeding the muscles. So that in itself can start decreasing the blood sugar level that is roaming in your blood. So in addition to masking hypoglycemia symptoms, it can also cause the patient to become hypoglycemic because of the action of glycogenolysis. Knowing all these baseline assessment points, you already know what you need to reassess or evaluate and I have them right here. So we're going to evaluate the blood pressure and heart rate within the proper time frame. So if you're giving a patient a beta blocker PO, it usually takes 45 to 60 minutes to get a response. So within that time frame, you want to make sure you go and reassess the patient to see was the medication effective or did it do an adverse effect. So you always want to have that information ready in case you have to act on it or call a healthcare provider. You want to make sure you reassess those lung sounds and a pulse ox because of those early signs of heart failure that can occur when a patient is taking a beta blocker. And you wanna also reassess any signs and symptoms of low blood sugar that your patient may express. They may not have the tachycardia or that anxiety that they can get with low blood sugar. However, they may have other signs and symptoms that are unique to that patient. So from all the points that we've talked about today, you should be very clear on what you should teach your patient. You already know through the mnemonic that the patient might have bronchospasms if, if given a non-selective beta blocker. Also, you know that the heart rate drops due to the decreasing conduction, which causes the decreasing contraction, in turn decreases the heart rate. So the patient's gonna feel tired. You know that it treats hypertension, so it's going to act on those juxtaglomerular cells of the kidneys, which are part of the beta-1 receptor sites, and it's going to decrease peripheral vascular resistance, and then the blood pressure drops. The patient is going to feel dizzy or lightheaded, so it's so important for you to teach them proper precautions when they are getting up from the bed, from a chair, to wait a couple of minutes or else they can fall and you don't want them to have a negative patient outcome. We also talked about the decrease in libido due to the decreased blood flow. And remember the importance of compliance. One of the parts of the mnemonic was do not abruptly stop because if they do abruptly stop the medication, they can have rebound tachycardia and high blood pressure. So it's so important for them to be tapered off the medication and not skip a dose. If they were to skip a dose or two, they should inform their healthcare provider so they can receive further instructions. Also, we talked about the fact that they can get GI upset and for your diabetics, they should be monitoring their blood sugar closely because beta blockers mask hypoglycemia symptoms. We reviewed the early signs and symptoms of heart failure. So you want to make sure you let your patient know that one of the effects that can occur is that they feel tired, they may feel a little short of breath, they may feel that they will start coughing a little bit more and also they can exhibit lower extremity edema because now the heart is not 
pumping out as much blood as it used to. So the cardiac output has decreased. There's some pooling of the blood. So the blood is going to settle in certain places. So it's very important that they know that those are effects that beta blockers have. However, they should monitor the progression and let their healthcare provider know if things get worse. Well, I hope that this video was of great use to you. Make sure that you go under this YouTube's playlist, Dr. Registered Nurse, and look at the AV block video that I put up, as well as the alpha and beta receptor video. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. And also that little bell in the corner, press it so that will give you notifications as to when I upload any other content. Again, I look forward to all of your comments and feedback. I read absolutely all of them as well as personally answer them. Thank you and have a great rest of your week. Bye.